Uh, hi guys. Um, how you doing out there? Uh, welcome to class. Uh, yeah. So, um, I stuck around after that fiasco, the online people did not see everything that was happening, but, um, so I say there was a bit of a technological catastrophe. Um, nothing was working. I stuck around and made it work eventually through some elbow grease, but, um, by that point it was far too late. It was, uh, you know, over a half hour into classes, um, schedule start period. So that's fine. Um, here's what we are going to accomplish today. I am going to spend, uh, today and tomorrow as well, talking about political sociology, especially in a global context, um, with a focus really on democracy and, and human rights, because that's going to be a big part of the upcoming, uh, assignment that everybody has to do. Okay. So, um, Here's my agenda today. I am going to start with a discussion of governments. I want to speak about the role in the creation of nation states. And then finally, I want to um, talk about democratization and in doing so, I want to highlight several of the threats to democracy. I want to highlight several of the things that can cause democracies to become not democracies anymore and to, in the worst case scenario, uh, cause countries to become not countries anymore. Um, and we'll do that by taking a look at the world's youngest country, South Sudan, which only became independent and joined the world system in 2011. In terms of my announcements, uh, your second reaction paper, please be aware that that's due this Friday. Um, the source material this time is going to be um, obviously the readings for the week, but especially I want this all to be applied to China Undercover. It is a frontline documentary um, that deals with, um, well, it deals broadly with China's regime, but the case that it really puts its critical eye towards is the Chinese crackdown on its Uyghur population in the autonomous Northwest region of Xinjiang, China. Um, that's an ethnic group that is religiously Muslim and linguistically they speak a language that's um, much more related to Mongolian and Turkish than it is to anything spoken in mainland China. Um, and these people, the 12 million Uyghurs that live in this region have been subject to some of the most intense human rights abuses uh, that we have seen in uh, many, many years throughout the world. Um, so that's the case study. And um, I will uh, expect you to go to the course page, right, where you will find both the link for the video and you will find the uh, writing prompt. So if there are any questions, ask me in class tomorrow or just feel free to email me and um, we'll, we'll certainly be able to talk about things. All right, let's get to my material. Um, today, there are four, um, but really five, but really actually only four systems of government that exist. So I want you as we're going through this, think about types of government, not like in a specific national sense, but what are the types of ways in which people are ruled, in which people are governed? The first, and there are gonna be four ideal types. The first is what's known as a monarchy. Um, and I don't mean in the UK sense. Um, European monarchies are largely symbolic at this point. No, I mean literal, actual monarchies. And the parts of the world in which we tend to have these types of hereditary family-ruled systems, they're almost exclusively in the Middle East. So some examples of this would be Saudi Arabia is perhaps the biggest and most powerful country that's ruled by a monarch, an absolute monarch. Um, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman would also qualify here as well. They're almost exclusively Petro states in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. Secondly is what's known as an authoritarian state. These are areas that do not have free or fair elections. They do not have direct citizen input in deciding who rules them, even if there is a role for some citizen uh, choice of policies. Um, there's obviously a lot of variability here. Um, and and their uh, elections is really what it comes down to. So authoritarian state, usually people are, are sort of Actions are, are controlled in a fairly heavy handed way. The three best examples I can give you for this are easily China, Iran, and Russia. Those three countries are, are probably the three most important authoritarian states uh, in the world today. Well, Saudi Arabia too, I guess would be up there as well. Um, but again, that's not, that's authoritarian monarchy. 
Now, third would be what political scientists call a totalitarian state. Now, thankfully, there are not too many examples of this throughout the world left anymore. Um, so the one that captures everybody's imagination is North Korea. One can also make a case for like maybe Belarus, but I think that's more of an authoritarian state. Maybe Myanmar, the former Burma, or the country that um, what, what Burma became um, because of the sheer amount of ethnic cleansing that has occurred from the Buddhist majority majority government against the Muslim and the Christian minority uh, in, in the country. So the difference between a totalitarian state and an authoritarian state is fairly simple. Um, a totalitarian state controls everything about day-to-day -day life, whereas authoritarian states generally just control um, large chunks of governmental decisions without direct democratic input. So if you compare China to North Korea, there's one really big difference between those two places that makes one totalitarian and the other authoritarian. Um, there's one thing that you can do in China that you can't do in North Korea, and that is leave the country. Um, your, your very movement in and out of the country is that heavily regulated in North Korea. And then the system of government that you and I would be most familiar with, what's known as democracy. So that is, um, that takes different forms, liberal democracies, republic democracies, direct democracies, whatever. I, I care more about just the overall idea. Um, so that is where um, people have um, either a direct input into the policies that exist within their country or directly choose the people that then uh, put those policies into effect. So the United States certainly qualifies here, Japan, Germany, Argentina, most of the wealthy countries of East Asia, most of Latin, of, um, not Latin, most of South America uh, qualifies as a democracy, most of uh, Western Europe, and several important countries in Africa as well, even if those democracies tend to be very unstable. And then the fifth, if you're wondering where this four, but maybe five, but maybe four, uh, thing is coming from. The fifth system of government, the fifth position that a state can take is actually no government at all. And that's what's known as a failed state. A failed state refers to a country that has lost the ability to provide even the most basic um, necessities for its citizens. So there are sadly too many examples of this. South Sudan, which we're going to talk about today, became a failed state um, fairly soon after its uh, independence. Um, Libya for a very long period of time, Syria, um, where the regime was not, not in control of huge chunks of that territory. Somalia has not really had a functioning government in, in 25 years, 30 years. Iraq, uh, in the aftermath of the invasion in the country, um, crumbles and falls apart. And then the Central African Republic and uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The one thing that almost every failed state has in common is conflict, civil war. Civil war is the number one determinant of uh, state failure, even if then, you know, it's other things that then predict uh, or determine civil war happening. So those are the five systems of government. And those are applied to the supreme political entity that we have built our entire global institutional system around. That's the nation state. The nation state's the most common form of political organization. And you likely have noticed that when you see this term written down somewhere and you see this term uh, used in various places, nation state is always hyphenated. So what's going on there? Well, to hyphenate nation state is to assume that there's actually two different elements of this. So let's break it down. A state refers to a political unit that governs a particular piece of geography. And then secondly, a nation refers to some type of cultural or ethnic group of people. So right, state is a political entity and nation is a group of people. And when we hyphenate this and use the term nation state, the assumption is that these two things coincide with each other geographically, that by and large, the people of a given nation live within a given state. And that distinction is breaking down a bit in the era and the time frame of globalization. So what I want to do here is kind of go through, I want to do some high level theorizing, which I hope will help you like sort of understand everything that comes from this point on the rest of the week. States are by and large assumed to have three qualities. 
things. Three things apply to nation states and have since the nation state became the primary political unit of um, dominance after the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 that sort of divided up Europe and in, in, by and large the system that it, that it had, uh, the, the borders and, and regions that it has today. States, and I'm going to, you don't have to uh, write down my definitions just yet because I'm going to go through these in order coming up on the next few slides. States have three qualities. They are sovereign, they are comprehensive, and they are unqualified. In order for the system to work, it's got to have those three things. And I'll pause for a second, let people make sure they're written down. All right, let's go through those in order. Sovereignty, comprehensiveness, and unqualified. To say that a nation state is sovereign is to say that that state is exercising authority over only their, over their given territory, but also only their given territory. So that makes the nation state sort of the undivided arbiter of everything that's happening within that particular area. Which seems obvious until you realize it's not actually obvious at all. We have always had global problems that face the world, but those problems have amplified and they have mutated in the era of globalization to the point where the most serious problems facing the world today are not domestic in scope. Please listen carefully to this because this is perhaps my fundamental theoretical contribution to like the understanding of political sociology in a globalized world. States can only exercise authority over their given territory, but the problems that we need to solve are not domestic in scope. They affect many different places and they affect the world system in a way that makes these problems really difficult to solve. So I tried to think of this, what are some problems that affect many countries that are not like national level problems, but are global problems scaled upward? Organized crime certainly would, would qualify here. Migration from one country to another. Refugeeism would certainly like be a, an even like an even more troubling version. Because migration, you may be moving somewhere because you chose to do so. You may become a refugee because someone chose to make you a refugee, and that's usually a far more troubling situation. Climate change, which like no one country alone is responsible for, and no one country alone will be affected by tax evasion. Billions of dollars leave countries every single year to avoid paying taxes, and that does hurt the poor, and that does increase global and national inequality. War crimes, we're going to learn about those on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. War crimes, um, you know, where do you prosecute those? What are the laws of war? Terrorism, these destabilizing elements of globalization are not domestic problems. So in this way, we assume that states can exercise authority over their given territory and only their given territory. And actually, that might be one of the biggest problems of globalization and one of the biggest issues facing our ability to actually make a more just and safe world out of what we got right now. Secondly, I wanted to talk about states being unqualified. What that means, and this very much should be paired with my um, argument on state sovereignty just, just a moment ago, to say a state is unqualified says that it doesn't really have to answer to any higher authority. And this is laughable. This might have been true a long time ago, and it just isn't. No, in reality, states answer often in very non-democratic ways to many higher authorities. So I can think of the UN, and for the record, like I, I'm not saying that if this is a bad thing. So don't misunderstand my argument. Like, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing that nation states have to answer to the UN or have to answer to the IMF. And world. Well, maybe it is bad to answer to the IMF, but probably not to the UN or the International Court of Justice or the European Union. In some ways, this can be a very positive element for, for many um, countries. So like, I'll just give an example of this sometimes being a, a good thing. Um, in the case of the European Union, just the organization I happen to know best, um, one of the things that uh, seems to have happened once Bulgaria 
one of the poorest and most corrupt countries in Eastern Europe, once Bulgaria was uh, initiated into the European Union, it does appear to have improved the corruption endemic to the public sector there. And it's because it's given the people, right, they have generally looked at European membership as a safeguard against domestic corruption. The belief is that it's made their elections a little more trustworthy and it's made their public uh, institutions a little cleaner uh, because there's some European oversight to this now. Um, and so it's not perfect in Bulgaria by any stretch of the word, but it, it does appear to have um, cleaned up various elements of what was a very corrupt post-Soviet um, sector at that particular time. The other problem though is, with the EU is that by and large, um, the more international organizations you got to answer to, the less you're able to actually execute democratic wills. And that is an important thing to keep in mind, right? Countries are no longer able to assume that they can do what they want to do. Sometimes that's good, right? In many ways, that's actually good. But I'm also remembering like the European sovereign debt crisis, which occurred from 2008 to 2011, spiked unemployment and youth joblessness all throughout the continent, created a, a, um, a, a currency crisis in Europe. It's really never been solved. Um, I'm not going to get into the deep, like the backstory of this, but um, fundamentally, the problem with the Eurozone and the Eurozone, that what that term refers to specifically, is the 19 countries of the European Union that share the common currency of the euro. So they're using the same type of money. You don't, that doesn't just mean that these countries are sharing money. They also now to a degree have to share fiscal policy. And that's where the system breaks down a little bit. The average Greek today is about as productive as the average American was in 1970. And now they're in a currency union with 2020 Germany. That is insane. I cannot stress how insane that is. Like you are never going to create fiscal policy that satisfies the Germans and the Greeks, Like right? The Greeks need spending in order to kickstart a broken economy. The Germans don't want to do that because they fear inflation above anything else. Um, the point is not what their specific concerns are. The point is they have to work together and is never going to satisfy both of them at the same time. So at one point in 2015, the left-wing government that got elected in the country was elected on a mandate of trying to end austerity all throughout the European continent. And so what ultimately happened was the Greeks voted democratically on a proposal to exit the Eurozone, not the EU, but to exit the Eurozone. The rest of Europe, mostly led by uh, Germany and um, Belgium and the Netherlands and France, uh, said no. They blocked that from happening. The democratic will of the Greek people, and they block that from happening. And I ask you, is that fair? And I'll answer my own question because there's nobody in the room. Actually, yes, maybe that is fair because when a country is sharing currency, it doesn't just affect the Greeks anymore. That's the cost of international cooperation and integration. And so changing currency, right? If the Greeks were to do that, if they were going to leave the Eurozone and if they wanted to then uh, get the drachma back, which was their old you know, money. Um, changing currency, this is not like changing clothes in your dorm room in between classes. If you want to get out of a currency arrangement and get a new one, you can do that because currency is traded freely on the open market. But what you'd have to do is sell off all your excess, excess euros and then essentially buy a new currency from some central bank. And what that would have done is flood the Eurozone with all these excess Euros and spiked inflation in all these other countries. And, and that was what the European Central Bank was completely opposed to happening. Um, and the Greeks are left holding the bag uh, on that point. So again, I, is that fair? Yeah, actually it kind of sounds like it is fair. And the fact that it is fair might be one of the big problems with the nation state today. And that leads me to my third point, which is um, we assume that nation states are comprehensive. States can act, exercise power over all aspects of national life, either through an authoritarian regime or through a democratic regime that puts this in the hands of voters every once in a while. 
This is just simply not true. In fact, many states don't even control their own territories, right? I'm showing part of the AFPAC region, right? Uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, if you know anything about this part of the world, it's because it was always assumed that when the American military apparatus lost track of bin Laden after the invasion of Afghanistan, a lot of people said, this is bullshit. Like being in Afghanistan is nonsense because he is clearly in Pakistan. Why Pakistan? Well, the northern areas, the tribal areas of Pakistan, the central government just does not control these areas. They, they don't. They do not control these areas in any real sensible way. And many nations themselves don't even have a state of their own. And those end up being some of the more oppressed peoples, you know, all throughout the world. So I'm just putting down here some of the uh, people that today would be uh, that are classified as a, as stateless ethnic groups, right? They are groups that do not have a, a nation or they are nations that do not have a state to advocate for their needs. That Tamil, the, uh, the Tamils in um, southern India and Sri Lanka, 76 million people. Not surprisingly, Sri Lanka was the source of a, was the site of a civil war, uh, low intensity civil war from 1983 to 2009. The Kurds, who are a constant minority in Iraq, in Turkey, and in Afghanistan, or um, not Afghanistan, in um, um, Syria, pardon me, Syria, Iraq, why did I say Afghanistan? Syria, Iraq, and Turkey, by and large. The Uyghurs, 15 million of them living in Northwest China, and the Balochs living in the Balochistan, like you can follow my map here, since uh, my mouse here, um, this Quetta region, this part of like Balochistan and, and this part of uh, Pakistan. Um, it's, a, it's an ethnic group of Pakistanis that are honestly much more related to uh, really the ethnic, ethnic groups of Afghanistan than anybody else in Pakistan. And it's a very oppressed ethnic group, right? The Pakistani military has always been, you know, um, well, let's just put it this way. Pakistan is not in control of at least half of her territory, and that's a constant issue for what is one of America's most, most important allies um, within the region. What this does is it creates a bit of a paradox. And this is to me, what I'm about to say is in my personal opinion, the fundamental problem of the 21st century. It's even higher than things like climate change and, and, and other issues like that. If we admit that, yes, this nation state is the supreme political unit and we are going to operate our institutions and construct global society around the nation state, now I have a problem. And that problem is as follows. Nations themselves are way too small to meaningfully solve problems. What country alone can fix climate change? What country alone can fix refugeeism? What country alone can fix tax evasion and virulent economic inequality? So nations can't do these things. But simultaneously, nations have grown too big to generate meaningful engagement. I read a book on the advice of an anthropologist. I read a book uh, somewhat recently called Sapiens. It was just pure learning for me because like the history of our species from like a biological and anthropology level is not something I'm super educated about. Um, but there was one thing that really stood out to me in that book. It argued that there's something baked into our, like our sociobiology that we can really only manage groups of about 30 people. And historically, I, I guess when a group gets bigger than that, it almost always mutates into subgroups, subcultures, sub whatever. Um, and so now, what if it's not just going beyond 30 people? What if it's a democracy of 327 million people, like in the United States? What if it's a democracy of over 1 billion people, like in India? Countries, these like in this in this way, they 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 do not generate meaningful full engagement among their citizens. Certainly not at the national level. To the degree that you see very meaningful engagement, it's often at the local level. And so that's been a surprising thing for many scholars of globalization. That the more globalized things get, the more many people double down on local culture, local identity, and local um, issues um, because that is like the closest thing you have to your day to day life. So I think, in, in my opinion, to build a functional citizen-state relationship, 
that is the challenge of our century going forward. That is the challenge. And we're going to need that, right? So like, perhaps this is a dumb example, but I've given it in other classes before, and I think it's illustrative. What if tomorrow, well, tomorrow's election day, so probably not, but what if the next American president, whoever that is, decides, you know what, I want to ban internet porn. I don't like it. I, I'm getting rid of internet porn. How would they go about doing that? So often we're told we need to sanction certain things or ban this or make that illegal. We don't give any like sense to what that is actually going to mean on the ground level. So I want you to think about this. If somebody wanted to ban internet porn, how would they go about doing it? Well, you could put sanctions on the user, but that's not getting rid of the product. Well, you could stop it from being filmed or created in the United States, but what about Germany and Japan, two other two countries that, that also maintain a, a fairly large porn industry? What you're left with is uh, a tacit acknowledgement that we cannot combat the thing itself. And that is what globalization has brought to us. That's the paradox. All right, give me two minutes. I wanna just take a quick break, stop, stop talking, kind of soothe my throat a little bit. Um, I will be right back uh, to transition to the second part of our class. All right, kids, we're back. Let's talk about democratization. So I presented that as like the fourth system of government kind of on purpose. Um, for one, I, most of us in the room like likely have not lived under anything other than a democracy. Um, some people say that starting tomorrow, we may not be one anymore. Um, I, I don't know. I certainly hope not. But I want to point out that anytime you see isation at the end of any word, and there are many such words within um, the fields of the social sciences, that is implying a process. And that is implying something that isn't just guaranteed. So having a democracy is very much like having a baby. When you have a child, you don't just like stop caring for that child immediately upon its birth. No, you have to nurture and take care of that child until they're 18. Um, and, and actually until they're about 25, if you believe recent statistics. So democracies in a similar way have to be care, cared for and they have to be nurtured and they are an action. They are something you have to actively be, you have to actively do democracy in order for it to have any meaning. Now, political scientists and sociologists have often cited 1974, the year 74, as democracy's third wave. 
So three waves of democracy, I'll go through these as quickly as I can. Um, the first wave happened in like kind of around the year 1900 when many countries, especially in Europe and a few in South America and the United States, extended universal suffrage to all white men. So that's not like a great current modern day definition. Um, but, but there was a time in the early 1900s when 29 countries throughout the world were classified as democracies, which was unprecedented at the time. Second wave of democracy occurred in the aftermath of the Allied victory in World War II. And then 1974 was kind of like the tidal wave of democracy. Um, many countries transitioned to democracy, all in very rapid transition um, from one another. So from 1974 onward, we saw the fall of military dictatorships in Portugal and Spain. We saw the collapse of military juntas in South America, and right, specifically Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Paraguay. We saw um, many, uh, post-1989, we saw many um, Eastern European and Central Asian countries uh, declare independence from the Soviet Union or the Soviet sphere of influence and become democracies. We also saw a wave of democratization post-1989 Africa as well. Many African countries transitioned to democracy. Um, note in this graph here, you can see from 1974 onward, percentage of electoral democracies and liberal democracies. So like electoral democracies like the United States, liberal democracies like Sweden, you know, just a much more sort of humane place. Um, since 1984, though, I, I want to point out, even though many countries have transitioned to democracy, one out of every four democracies or countries that has transitioned to democracies has actually failed. And I want you to note that after the year 2000, we need a term for this. If 89 is the tidal wave of democracy, after 2000, what is that? That's a stagnation, right? That is, I guess, a low tide. I don't know what you'd call it. But either way, one out of four, think about that. That's just, that's two flips of the coin. That is a process of democratic breakdown or a term that we use for this is called democratic backsliding when a country goes backwards from being a democracy. Um, why? One out of four is two flips of the coin. That is not a, a that is a sadly kind of common issue that, that's occurring throughout the world. And my question here is why? And in order to understand this better, I want to more closely examine the country of South Sudan, which is the youngest country in the world. And it's a country that never really was a democracy. And I want to use it as a very extreme example and case study as to why democracy was doomed there in the first place. Um, South Sudan is itself, like the country itself, was born out of war and ethnic cleansing and genocide, a tremendous amount of um, violence. So from 2003 to 2011, you may remember this if you've if you heard uh, have heard at all about the crisis in Darfur, that was the Sudanese government ethnically cleansing the southern ethnic groups usually in incredibly brutal ways. Um, and so this was part civil war, part just social atrocity. And ultimately it ended in a full on partition of the country. South Sudan was partitioned, was hacked off of Sudan and made its own country. So the, it was originally created to be a democracy, right? Nobody creates a new country and says, we're just going to make that a dictatorship. Now that comes later. So what I want to do here is apply to Sudan many of the lessons we've learned from studying other countries and try to understand what is it about a country that makes it vulnerable to democratic backsliding or consolidation of authoritarian and dictatorial power. You should think of these not as like a baking recipe. It's not that you need all of these things necessarily. Think of this more like a salad bar. Countries that have certain attributes are better positioned to become democracies. And most importantly, countries that lack these prerequisites very often struggle to maintain a democracy and are very prone to collapsing. 
So the first, we always start with looking at economic development. People got to make a living, right? I know I do. Here's a finding that shouldn't surprise anybody. The higher your incomes are, that generally stabilizes democracy. And it does so for two reasons. The first is that wealthier, the wealthier people are, it gives them something to protect. They have an increased stake in the government. A lot of the um, discontent that occurred in the popular uprisings of 2011 throughout the world, especially the, the Arab Spring, um, you had a lot of young people who didn't really feel super invested in the system and didn't really feel like they had anything to protect. And so upsetting the apple cart is not a, not a terribly, you know, uh, scary thing to people who don't feel like they have a lot to lose. So the wealthier a country gets, people are much more prone to fixing their problems or trying to through the electoral system. Mm -hmm. People simply have an increased stake in the government and its continued existence, the wealthier they are. We have a term for this, actually. If you notice, we have a term for everything. We call this the price of democracy, and it's about $9,000. That is to say, no country with a GDP per capita above $9,000 has ever collapsed. Below that, you might. And then the second part of this is that wealthier people generally demand more accountability. They exercise more oversight over their public institutions. They exercise more oversight over their situation in the government, right, in their representation. They demand a little more accountability. It's not that poor people don't demand accountability or want to can't accountability, but their political power is limited for a couple reasons. One, um, there's not a lot of money to be made in serving the needs of the poor. So like private sector businesses are never going to really like pay all that close attention to them. And then secondly, um, being poor makes you hyper focused on today, right, on solving my problems today, rather than working on democratic movements within a country that has an uh, unstable um, or, or a democracy or no democracy at all in, in many cases. Now, if we look at this in South Sudan, remember what I said the price of democracy was about $9,000? In South Sudan, the GDP per capita is $1,045. That's annually. So do the math on that. You can see how many people are living in incredibly impoverished situations. So it was not a country well set up for people to um, pay very close attention to their democratic um, situations. All right, so that's number one. But of course, what every sociologist cares about is not just how much money there is within a society, but how it is distributed. And that gets to the issues of income inequality, which is always correlated with lower quality of life for people. Income inequality is very dangerous for de uh, democracies, very dangerous. For starters, inequality is correlated with poverty, and we already know that that's a problem. But more importantly than that, inequality breeds a lot of social class resentment. It breeds relative deprivation. It leads people to believe and to see that, hey, my life could be a lot better. And it's not. Why isn't it? It gives people a target for aggression and for anger. And quite frankly, I don't blame them in a country like South Sudan, where we see that uh, despite all that poverty, the wealth that exists there has been strongly captured by many people um, but by a very small national elite that's been able to dominate the political institutions and the economic institutions. I'll get to those two issues in a second. But if I look at this, let's let's look at this graph here first, right? The blue bar, where you can see trends in South Sudan's human development index from 2010 to 2018. And we can see that life expectancy has gone up, actually, but gross national income per capita has been going down. War might have something to do with that. Education is almost non-existent within the country. And um, the HDI is a result, like life is actively getting worse for people. And that can breed a lot of resentment, right? Like people do not have a big stake in the continuation of a government in a country that was born a few years ago. And life is actively getting worse for many people. So in South Sudan, if I look at the Gini index, remember the uh, this is a measure of inequality within a country. 
The Gini index is 45.5. That's very high. That's almost the level of economic inequality that the United States has. So poverty is worse in South Sudan than it is in the United States, but by and large, like the inequality there shows you that there is wealth, there is money. It's just so maldistributed. So if you're keeping score at home, and you should be, Poor countries, right, countries below a certain per capita income are risks for democratic collapse and countries with a high level of inequality are risks for democratic collapse. And then third, this is particularly relevant in the African context, the two places where the resource curse is the most uh, poisonous are Africa and the Middle East in that order, right, the Middle East and North Africa region. So here's the definition of the resource curse. I have alluded to this and I want to talk about it in some detail here. Countries with very rich nat uh, natural resources, sometimes that's oil and gas, other times that's minerals, other times that is some type of export commodity that isn't found in other places. But if you have natural resources, those countries tend to do worse, actually. Statistically, they're less likely to be democratic, they're likely to have more poverty, and they're likely to have a lot more inequality. So countries that have these natural resources actually are democratic risks. And this is a reason why um, modernization theory has been kind of discarded by a lot of uh, scholars in the modern era, because we can just look at the scorecard and say that, all right, modernization theory said that you need to have these natural resources and you need to sell them and you need to make revenue and reinvest it back in the society. Whoa, hold on a second. What if those profits never get reinvested back into the society? What if they just go to enriching certain people? That right there is the crux of the resource curse. Economic inequality creates a very stressful situation for everybody, including the rich. And, and the record, I'm not, I don't feel bad for the rich, but like, you know what it's going to mean to fall into poverty if you're doing well for yourself. You know the stakes. And so economic inequality, once there is an economic advantage, that tends to breed political inequality. It leads to efforts to undermine democracy in order to protect the economic advantages that people have. And so what you're seeing here, this is a two by two cross tab, right? Do you have inclusive economic institutions or exclusive economic institutions? To say that an institution is inclusive economically means that the the gains or the profits from something are generally distributed throughout the society right it's not to say we can't have private ownership or, or or profit making but generally speaking it's invested in a way that the whole society benefits exclusive economic institutions means that the sale and the profits from natural resources just go to fund a national elite which sounds a bit like saudi arabia to me Sounds a bit like the UAE to me, and sounds a lot like Russia to me. Then if we think about the political institutions, that's a measure of democracy, right? If you have exclusive political institutions, that means political power is hoarded by an elite class within that country. Also sounds like Russia and Saudi Arabia to me. An exclusive political, um, or an in, and, uh, excuse me, inclusive political institutions means that you generally have an established democracy. So if you're looking for a country that's beaten the resource curse, look no further than Norway, one of the cleanest democracies in the world, and they have a crap ton of oil. But that oil has been used to really fund the building up of that country over many decades and many generations. And today, I mean, look, Norway is not exactly a terrible place to live. It's actually a quite pleasant place to live. Unsuccessful countries like South Sudan with all their oil, gas, and minerals pair exclusive economic institutions with exclusivity in political institutions. So because there's so much competition to capture the resource profits, the political institutions bear the scars of that as well, and they become less democratic. And South Sudan, like most places in Africa, is very wealthy in resources. And this to me, it, like there are many reasons, many, why Africa has struggled to develop, struggled to, um, to, to create democracies. 
But for my money, the, the most important reason among many is the fact that these resources have been exploited by foreign companies to, to enrich a small national elite that allows this to happen. And that leads me to another really serious problem with many countries, identity-based divisions. This doesn't have to be a problem. I alluded to this last week. Canada is pretty fractionalized and diverse. So is the United States, right? Germany is getting there with all their immigration. Um, Switzerland is, is very fractionalized. But what you really care about is polarization. Do various ethnic groups and cultural units within a country feel that they are part of some larger unit? Well, if your country was just created in 2011 and the country it came from previously was created as a byproduct of, uh, col of uh, col colonization first and then neocolonialism second, it is unlikely that people look beyond the experience of their narrow cultural unit. And if you combine this, the fact that there's ethnic uh, polarization, ethnic groups, cultural groups are living fundamentally different lives, and they're doing so in a place with a lot of poverty and um, corrupt economic institutions and deeply uh, unequal economic arrangements, that encourages challengers. So what you're seeing here, it's the map of ethnic groups in the Republic of South Sudan. And you can see how diverse these places actually are, right? If, if Africa had been allowed to develop nation states in generally in the process that Europe did, much of Africa would look very similar to Eastern Europe right here, where you have like kind of small political units refer referencing and representing um, generally small ethnic groups. But Africa was never given the chance to do that and to coalesce into modern nation states. It was pushed upon Africa, again, like first through colonization and second through decolonization, um, which left behind groups of people living under one flag that never really saw themselves as country mates to begin with. And again, if you combine that with the extractive nature of institutions and exclusive institutions, there's a real incentive to capture political power for your ethnic group. And to then reward, and because again, there's no dictator that can do it all on their own. So if you're wondering what was the spark of the 2011 Sudanese civil war, um, there was an ethnically motivated mutiny within the government, or actually it might've just been an accusation, but either way, it, it ended up sort of becoming a, a really serious ethnic conflict. So, I mean, it's sad. It's like, I, I don't, like on the one hand, I, I don't want to say that diversity can't work. I do want to say that there's a lot of evidence that it is challenging to maintain a multi-ethnic democracy, right? In the United States and France, two other very multi-ethnic democracies are having trouble with it and having trouble representing the needs of everybody in a fair and just and safe way. And then finally, that leads me to corruption. This, so we're getting kind of to the end uh, end of this here, close enough. But do you remember, I know I showed this map here, I just want to point out South Sudan. You remember the Corruption Perceptions Index map? Just look at how blood red South Sudan is. It's one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And I want to make sure we all have the causality right here. Nations aren't poor because they're corrupt. The causality flows the other way. They are corrupt because they are poor. The conditions of poverty are degrading for local populations and they create incentives and opportunities for um, the rule of law to get corrupted. So South Sudan, like you're already kind of starting from a position that the public sector is, is not particularly clean to begin with. And I want you to think, like, think about the effect of that on like the psyche of individuals of like realizing like, I'm not sure I can trust my government. I'm not sure I can trust anything about the national state and apparatus of the country that is supposed to be looking out for me. 
And that leads to really one of the final, one of the biggest um, long-term issues with maintaining a democracy. How much experience do you have with pluralism? Like we're gonna have an election literally tomorrow. And we knew we were gonna have that election four years ago and four years before that. Our, we have uh, so much experience with pluralism and power sharing and power transfers that when it happens, it's not a new or unique thing to us, but for young countries, like it's it's on the one hand, it's it's uh, it's it's really tempting to look at South Sudan and say you are the one of the most corrupt countries in the world. You need to clean your shit up before anything else is ever going to happen. One might also respond to that and say, you know what South Sudan is? Nine years old. <laughs> it's nine years old. And many successful democracies today got years, decades, generations to figure out what their democracy was going to look like. South Sudan's had nine years. And it, and it came out of a pre-existing system that was already on fire to begin with, like in, the, in terms of the, the collapse of Sudan itself. So I want you like just kind of going through all these situations. How is any faith in democracy going to develop? How? Right? A lot of people come to view it as like, it's a nice idea, but it probably doesn't, it's not going to work here uh, because we don't have the conditions, right? How can faith in democracy develop? People will come to see it as it's prone to corruption and it's pointless, right? It's pointless. And, 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 and that can lead people to not be allergic to authoritarian rule, which might actually sometimes bring a measure of order to a country that doesn't have it. And so we saw this very clearly in the 2015 Sudanese election, which was the last election before the civil war broke out in 2016, um, littered with poor planning. Like people did not really know how to run an election and how to do it efficiently in uh, a country that had never had any experience with it before. So democracy don't forget this, no matter what happens tomorrow, democracy is about institutions. It's not about the ideology of democracy. It's not about voting and it's not about elections. It's about the institutions. Are the institutions uh, responsive to the philosophy of democracy and to the uh, people that are supposed to be in charge of that democracy? Yeah. So. Summing up, South Sudan has very poor economic development, extremely high inequality, very high rural urban inequality. I guess I forgot to say that earlier, but yeah, very high rural urban inequality. They're cursed with resources that other people want. They have extremely extractive, exclusive economic institutions that they themselves are byproducts of colonialism in Africa generations ago and almost no experience with pluralism, power sharing, and power transfers. So here's my question that I would end class on today. The question is not why did, um, the, the question is not why did uh, the South Sudan, um, sorry, let me start, I'm, I'm, I'm flustered because I'm trying to turn this off. Um, the question is not why did Sudan's democracy fail, South Sudan's democracy fail, the question is, why were you ever expecting it to be uh, successful in the first place? So uh, whew, I'm done talking. Thank you so much for watching this video. You are responsible for all this material. If there are any, any, any questions at all, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you so much and um, take care. Ooh.